So a little bit about Goya. Goya began his career as an academic artist, as I said, and by 1799, he was the chosen court painter of Charles IV. Here you can see a painting appropriately then called Charles IV of Spain and his family from 1800 through one. Goya is very well known for his portrait paintings of society nobles and of the royal family. But at the same time, he was making a lot of his pocket change, making money to survive as an artist, certainly from painting the royal family and nobility. He was also weighing that out with his great feeling of being a romantic artist, trying to lend credence or lend truth to the idea of reflecting on the real world as it actually was. So he couples doing these sometimes odd portraits. I talked about this in, one of my, in my 18th and 19th century class a few weeks ago. It's a weird portrait. We're not gonna have enough time to spend looking at all the faces there, but it's, it's, a, it's a peculiar portrait. But he coupled that with doing other works like this, um, and probably his most famous work. This is third, the 3rd of May, 1808 from 1814. This painting is in the Prado Museum in Madrid, and it is recounting events that took place, importantly, during the Peninsular War. The Peninsular War transpired between 1807 and 1814. It was a fight between the French, the French and the Spanish initially, against the Portuguese and the English for control of the Iberian Peninsula. Within one year, however, the French turn on Spain and they take over Spain in 1808. What you're seeing here in one of two pendant pairs of paintings on the 3rd of May, 1808, is the aftermath of the French takeover of Spain. And so we're seeing a brutal reality that war is not always glory, war is not always heroes, war does have victims as well. So it's a brutal look at truth and that's that romantic vision. At the same time, he's exploring that in paintings. He also works on one of his most important series called the Disasters of War series. He, pub he worked on these between 1810 and 1820. They were not published until after his death, though. They were published in 1863. The Disasters of War series took this same premise from Goya that he wanted to reflect on all the brutality of man upon man, this idea of human carnage, what men can do to each other, men and women can do to each other in terms of inflicting damage on one another, and also to look at why Spain was in the place it was by the end of 1814 when Napoleon's troops were expelled from Spain. So at the same time, he's exploring this in his Disasters of War series, which takes its explicit premise as war, I argue in that show that we have here in the Tauromachia series, which he published in 1816, that he's exploring another element of Spanish culture, trying to revive a bit of Spanish spirit that may have been diminished during the years of French occupation. In one way, you can certainly look at the war years, look at what actually happened. But if there is something that's going to revive the now certainly diminished, the dispirited people of Spain, let's look towards something as a native tradition. And so he explores in the midst of 40 plates, and we have the, we have the entire 40 plate Tauromachia series up in this show. He explores the theme of bullfighting from ancient Iberian times all the way through to his own days in 1816. So as you can see here, I've only put up a few plates here because you can go into the show. This is plate one. And in this case, we're looking at ancient Iberians hunting bulls. So the story starts out with bull hunting, and then it turns into a spectator sport. But what we trace out in the show, and what I'm going to trace out in the next few moments here before handing over the mic to the other panelists, is this concept that Goya is trying to find something that is essential to the Spanish spirit. The bull and the bull fight seems to be something emblematic of the Spanish people. So he explores this at great length through the 40 prints of the suite. Here we jump ahead just to plate 20. Now you can see the bullfighting represented as a spectator sport, as an arena competition. By the time we get to about plate 20, this would have been more of the style of bullfighting that Goya would have seen in his own day. We come to the last plate of the original series, plate 33, and we can see one of the stars of the day, Pepe Ilo, is being mauled, killed by the bull. That's the original cycle. It was originally 33 prints, and eventually, at the time of its third printing in the 1860s, there, was, there were seven more plates that were discovered on the back of other plates. So we added seven more to the series. Whether or not Goya ever would have intended them to be part of the 40 print suite, we can't know. But now there are 40 official plates to the entire suite. So Goya sees bullfighting and bulls as something that is consequential to Spain, and he hopes that's going to enliven their spirits. Picasso also loved bulls. 
for rather different reasons and some of the same reasons too. So I love this photograph. This is Picasso in a large bull head mask in Valoris, France from 1949. If you've been through the exhibition, you may have read some of the text that I inserted in the show. Valoris is where he created his ceramics. And we'll have a nice discussion from Andrew Coombs coming up about his pottery. But here, Picasso has transformed himself into a mythological creature of a kind. Anybody know what kind of creature that he is? Head of a bull, body of a man. He's a minotaur. Picasso loved to think of himself as being a minotaur because if we think about bulls, they're macho and really manly and great womanizers as he saw that. It doesn't really make much sense, of course. But Picasso loved one thing less than himself, but he loved himself most and he loved women second to himself. But he also thought of bull as being kind of the spirit that he inhabited within himself. And here you can see him literally putting on a bull's head. And so I'm just going to flash through to show you how often, and this is a small sample of how often the minotaur as consequential to something of Picasso himself, but also what he thought of it made him a true Spaniard through and through. The Minotaur appears many, many, many times, especially in the 1930s. And that's important because in the 1930s, Spain is going through another troubling time, and that's the Spanish Civil War. So you'll find this common thread of turning to the imagery of the bull in times of war or in times of diminished Spanish spirit. So this is one image here from 1937. Here is Minotaur with dead mare in front of a cave from 1936. And remember, in each of these instances, it may be more generally symbolic of Spain or the Spanish spirit, but also think that's Picasso's self-portrait a lot. He's always basically somewhere in all of his works. Picasso Minotaur pulling a cart, 1936. Picasso Minotaur kneeling over a sleeping girl, 1939. That's very Picasso, obviously. Uh, Picasso, his Minotaur Machia from 1935 as well. And Picasso even said, if all the ways I have been along were marked on a map and joined up with a line, it might represent a minotaur in 1960. So the minotaur is something that is a great focus for Picasso throughout his career, but so is the bull itself, even more generally. And one of the works we have up in the exhibition, is, which is on loan from the MFA in St. Pete, is the, which, is, which is bull or beef, which is crude, of course. So, right, he sees it either as an actual living animal or as meat, and that's from 1935 as well. And so that is in the show. But what we see often throughout his career as well, all the way back in 1901, Picasso himself was focusing on bullfighting as something emblematic of his being a Spaniard. Now, Picasso, although he's the greatest known Spanish painter of the 20th century, he's also the best known French painter of the 20th century. He made his name in Paris. And what you see in a lot of his early work and throughout his career is reflecting back on his Spanish heritage. So when you see this return to the theme of the bull and the minotaur and the bull fighting, that is constantly reflecting upon where he came from. So in 1901, Picasso is actually moving between Barcelona and Paris most every few months. He knew that he was making his way in Barcelona, being trained as an artist, but he also knew if he had to make his name somehow, it had to be in Paris. So during this time, he's moving back and forth. And here you can see one of his early styles. Um, I bet many of you would not even know this is Picasso, if you saw it. Picasso has, it will campaign in any style, any time, and any day of the week. So this is one early style. Picasso bullfight, again, 1934 here. Some people say this is one of his more surrealistic styles. Picasso bullfight scene, 1960. So here we have 13 years before his death. And this should also remind you of some of the plates, also the ceramics in the show. And that brings us to one of the other works, important for us to have in the show to tie this theme together. This is Picasso's Corrida, or Bullfight, from 1953. And it's a huge plate, if you've been in the, in the show. We're really happy with it. It really it seems to occupy a lot of the space and echoes really nicely all the Goya plates on the surrounding walls. So with all these ties to the bullfighting theme or to the theme of bulls in Spanish history, that brings us to our main question tonight in a moment, and I just need to show you one more thing here. In terms of Picasso's relating the theme of the bull to Spanish history, perhaps the most famous painting of the 20th century is Picasso's Guernica from 1937. It is commemorating the bombing of the Basque town of Guernica um, during the Spanish Civil War, and he was commissioned to create this large mural in the Reina Sofia Museum in Madrid, and as you can see, one element of it, in addition to the weeping women and the crying horses and the mutilated bodies, there is that bull overhead. And for him, this is emblematic, again, of Spanish spirit, the resiliency of Spanish spirit, even in the face of aerial bombing. It's also a reference to Picasso himself, because anytime you see a bull in Picasso, just think it's Picasso. 
So again, that brings us then to this unifying premise for our panel discussion and Q&A and lectures this evening. If Goya and Picasso identified the bullfight as the most potent symbol of Spanish tradition, then what can we identify as essentially Spanish in Florida, right? So that gives us that premise. If Florida was originally a colonial Spanish place, what can we identify in that way? And so that is all I will say for the moment. I will be returning every so often so you can hear me sniffle my way through and I apologize again. But let me introduce our first panelist. Uh, Dr. David Arbesu is Associate Professor of Spanish and Graduate Program Director at the University of South Florida, where he teaches courses on medieval and golden age Spain and transatlantic Florida studies. He holds a BA and MA in English Philology from the University of Oviedo in Spain and a MA and PhD in Spanish from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He has published many articles and has authored four books. So David, I want to clean this off for you. Yeah, let me clean this for you. Anyway, I'm gonna, I'm gonna clean this for you. Good, I'm gonna get rid of germs. I apologize. It's okay, I got my vaccine. It's okay. <laughs> Not everybody. Good. Thanks. I think I'm gonna go. I'm gonna do like you and get the the mic. Well, thank you very much uh, to the organizers of this wonderful event. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm honored that they've chosen me to be part of this panel. Um, and uh, I think my job as the first speaker, and I think everybody has heard what my specialty is, is to actually take you back to the 16th century, so it's a bit of a jump, and show you the relationship between Spain and Florida from the very, very beginning, uh, at least you know from 1513, but I would argue uh, even sooner than that. Uh, so there's a bit of disconnect here with what Alex was, had said, but uh, since Alex was showing you pictures by Goya in which uh, French uh, soldiers were killing Spaniards, I'm going to take my revenge and, sold, and show you Spaniards killing Frenchmen here. So <laughs> I think it's a, it's a connection here. Uh, basically, um, I'm giving you here one of the manuscripts by uh, Pedro Menéndez de Avilés, and who is the, I'm sure you know he's the founder of uh, St. Augustine. And he's actually complaining to the king that uh, there's no way that he can find any men uh, that want to go to Florida because all the seven fleets that the kings of Spain had sent before him had actually ended up in disaster. They're all shipwrecked and uh, everybody had died. That's actually one of the reasons why uh, Pedro Menendez's uh, enterprise in uh, St. Augustine was a family affair. He had to uh, find friends and relatives that wanted to travel with him because nobody else was suicidal enough to come to Florida. Um, <laughs> The thing with Florida is that uh, um, for Spain, Florida was one of the main, main uh, um, targets in the Americas. Uh, and even though it took them 52 years, and that's, that's a long time, no other territory in the Americas was so difficult to, to settle in, it took them more than half a century to be successful. And actually, I'm going to show you that it was kind of uh, a miracle. Uh, why Pedro Menendez was successful. Uh, they still had to keep on trying because, you know, all the ships that come from the Caribbean to return to Spain, they have to go through the, um, um, the Bahama Channel uh, because of the current. So, you know, if the English or the French were actually in Florida, they could destroy every single Spanish ship that was coming back to Europe. So, um, I mean, Florida was either yes or yes. There was no other option. Um, the first one, of course, you know, it's uh, uh, the, um, the enterprise of uh, Juan Ponce de Leon, and excuse my Castilian pronunciation, Ponce de Leon, I guess. And uh, 1513, it's actually a very interesting story. I don't have time to go into it. Uh, but for the longest time, I'm sure you know too, uh, everybody thought that the year was 1512. Uh, because actually this expedition was only recorded a hundred years later in 1601 and uh, somebody had the nice idea of writing 1512 in the margin um, so they were confused until 50 years ago when actually people started running the dates and they realized that wait you know this is actually the the, the following year 1513 and uh, and actually it's interesting because today's April 3rd and Ponce actually uh, got to uh, Florida on April 2nd so it's actually been 505 days 505 years and one day today. So it's a, it's a nice occasion here. Uh, with, with Ponce, and that's why I was saying it's not the beginning of the 16th century, it's probably the, the end of the 15th century that, that Spain began its relationship with Florida. It's because we know that people had been to Florida before, Europeans had been to Florida before. First of all, because when Ponce arrived in Florida, he actually found a Spaniard living there with the natives. Um, so that's already good proof that somebody was there. 
But also, if you think about it, we have maps from even before uh, Ponce's expedition. Uh, uh, both, of, both of them are very famous. One is the one by Alberto Cantino in 1502, and that's the one on the, on the left in color. And if you can see the island of Cuba, the very, very left, you can see there's a kind of a peninsula on top of it, which, I mean, again, we don't know, but it's probably Florida. And then the other one leaves no, no room for, um, for doubt, the, um, another famous map by Peter Martyr in 1511. That's, again, two years before Pontes. If you see the island of Cuba, there's a line of islands there, the Keys. And then there's a peninsula there that if you flip, if you flip the, map, the map around, uh, you can see it says something like Isla de Beimeni Parte. So this is part of the island of Pimini, which was what they called Florida back then. Uh, so basically, both maps and the presence of Spaniards in Florida when Ponce arrived tell you that even though he's been claimed as the founder and the, uh, of Florida, he was actually not the first one there. It's just that we don't have any chronicles of the expeditions before him. The 52 years, actually, since Ponce's uh, first expedition in 1513 and the founding of St. Augustine in 1565 is what uh, historian Eugene Lyon has called the Enterprise of Florida, which is all these continuous attempts by Spaniards to settle in Florida. They all failed miserably. Um, as you can see, uh, Ponce ca came twice, 1513, 1521. Then there's the expedition by Garay. Uh, Vázquez de Ayón, Narváez, Hernando de Soto, Barbastro, every two, three, four years, uh, Spain would try again to settle in Florida because of its uh, strategic importance. But again, all the expeditions were a disaster. Uh, Ponce actually was uh, wounded by the natives of Florida, and he went back to Cuba, where he died from the wounds. Uh, Ayón and de Soto were taken ill in their camps, and they, they again died. And I, I guess the most famous of them, Pamphilo de Narváez, was shipwrecked off the, off, the coast, uh, off the Gulf of Mexico, the coast of the Gulf of Mexico, and he was never seen again. Uh, so it's not surprising that in 1561, the King of Spain, Philip II, said, you know what, there's no more expeditions to Florida. I'm done, 52 years. And as you can see, he changed his mind, right? <laughs> so, and the reason why he changed his mind, and here comes the, the famous one, or the infamous one, depending on whether you're French or Spaniard, um, it's Pedro Menéndez de Avilés. The reason he changed his mind is because he learned that the French were back in North America. And at this time in Europe, we had the wars of religion, and, and these people were Lutherans. And of course, in Spain, they were Catholics, so they could not afford having uh, uh, the French in, 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 the Spanish, uh, in the Spanish colonies, and also because they were of a different religion. Uh, so he had to uh, get one of his most experienced uh, sailors, which was Pedro Menéndez, and really, really quickly set up an expedition to Florida, which is very, very interesting. Again, I'm just gonna give you the one highlight here. Um, Pedro Menendez actually, um, his main concern was to get to Florida before the French could be reinforced. And he was not very lucky in that respect, although you'll see what happens, because on August 28, 1565, when he actually made it up the, uh, up the coast of Florida, at the same time, he saw the French reinforcements coming into the port of uh, what was called back then uh, Fort Caroline. Um, so basically, the French beat him by a couple of hours, not even. Um, um, and for, uh, fortunately, though, he went back and, uh, down the coast and founded St. Augustine a week later uh, on September 8th, and, and you know that probably. But what you may not know <clears throat> is that um, Pedro Menéndez was actually the first successful attempt at uh, colonizing Florida. Um, but it wasn't really because of anything he did. It was because of this miracle hurricane. And I always tell my students that if you're going to believe in one miracle, it has to be this one. Because what should have happened here is that uh, if the French uh, fleet had followed, uh, the French fleet actually followed Pedro Menendez back to St. Augustine. And what should have happened is that they should have destroyed the Spaniards because they were very, very superior in numbers. And the Spaniards had just gotten there there had been a previous hurricane that had made Pedro Menendez lose half of his fleet. And uh, so the numbers were not good. But at that precise moment when the French fleet came into the port of St. Augustine, there's this huge hurricane. It sinks all the ships and it sends two or three ships down, down south. And the Spaniards were in land and they didn't have to do anything. So what they did was they walked up to Fort Caroline, which had very few men because everybody was on the ships, and they actually took the fort really, really quickly and easily, and they renamed it San Mateo. And then, to make things even worse, um, all Pedro Menendez had to do was go down the coast, pick up the survivors from the French shipwrecks, and kill them all because um, uh, the natives were pointing to him where the, where the survivors were, 
and here's my revenge of the Spaniards killing French. Uh, and this is, I guess, the episode by which Pedro Menéndez is also known. Of course, the English and the French use these episodes as, as, uh, as propaganda against the Spain, saying, look at how cruel Catholics are and look at what this person did. And this is a very controversial episode. Some people say, well, he couldn't feed them. You know, he couldn't keep them as prisoners. That's a lot of men, 900 men in Florida. There was nothing to eat. But of course, other people say, well, yeah, but he killed 900 men, that he, they had no weapons. Okay, but, um, but this is it, like, he didn't have to do anything. It was just that hurricane that actually allowed for the first time Spain to be successful in the colonization of, of uh, Florida. Um, really quickly here, um, oops, um, just to give you the chronicles, because I always like about the chronicles, about the uh, Pedro Menéndez expedition, there's two main chronicles here. One is the, uh, um, uh, 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 the priest of the expedition and the first vicar of St. Augustine, which is, uh, again, Spaniards have very long names, Francisco López de Mendoza Grajales, and it's a very short diary in which he gives all the details of the, of the expedition, but it's only 10 pages long, so it doesn't give much detail. The second one, it's another first-hand witness, which is his brother-in-law, uh, Gonzalo Solis de Meraz. So, as I told you, this is a family affair, so he took most of his family with him. And uh, as you can see, this is the, the only manuscript we knew up until 2012. It's kind of problematic, it's missing a lot of sections, and it's very, very hard to read. And then, in 2012, I had the luck of, of finding a second copy of the Gonzalo Solis de Meraz Chronicle, and this one, as you can see, is much, much uh, nicer. And the main thing is that it's complete and in order. So for the first time, we actually have the whole picture of the founding of uh, St. Augustine. I'm going to leave it here. Um, and I'm going to um, just tell you that you know the, the, all these uh, uh, failures that Spain had and all these, uh, the one success, it's given us a lot of uh, important literature about the United States written in or about the United States, not only the chronicles of the expeditions, but several literary works like the uh, Shipwrecks by Cabeza de Vaca, who Melissa is going to talk about too, the memoir by Escalante Fontaneda, Herrera's description of the Indies, and Garcilaso de la Vega's The Florida of the Inca. But thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um, just a, little, a few things about how this will work tonight. Each of the panelists will give their lectures, and then at the very end, we will open it up for a question and answer. So if you do have questions that arise, as your minds are fascinated by everything everyone's talking about tonight, please write them down in front of you, um, and so you can mention them at the end, okay? Um, so we'll move through it in this manner, and then we'll return to everyone in terms of discussion coming up later. So next, I, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Melissa Garr. She is a colleague of mine at Florida Southern College, and she is the assistant professor of Spanish at the college. She earned her MA in Spanish from the University of Northern Iowa and her PhD in Spanish literature from Purdue University. Her research centers on transatlantic detective fiction, Mikhail Bakhtin, and 20th and 21st century Spanish literature. Dr. Gar has 20 years of experience teaching Spanish language and literature at the secondary and post-secondary levels. It's my pleasure to welcome Melissa. And I'll wipe this up. So you heard of all my specialties, detective fiction, Mikhail Bakhtin, 20th and 21st century Spain. I'm talking about none of that tonight. So uh, um, I'm going to start where uh, David left off for me today, um, talking about Cabeza de Vaca, whose name actually does mean cowhead, if you're not familiar with Spanish. Just, I did find out yesterday exactly why his name is cowhead. So if you want to ask that later, I'm giving you an opening for the Q&A. Um, Naufragios, which means shipwrecks, was published um, the first chronicle in 1542, and it details the Narvaez, the failed Narvaez expedition um, from 1528. 480 men go to this expedition. They leave Havana, and um, by the time they leave Florida, the Florida area, there are only 251 left. They leave on five homemade boats. They take all their stuff apart, put them back together in boats, and they ship off. And this is the route that the survivors sort of take after being shipwrecked. Um, and then uh, by the time they all make it back to Spanish territory, there's only four left. Among them is, of course, Cabeza de Vaca, and he writes, his chronicle, and it took him eight years to walk 
from Florida all the way back to Mexico. One thing I wanna point out here on this map is um, they kept talking about in the very beginning part um, that they were gonna leave the boats behind and they were gonna try to meet up with them at a harbor they thought was just 10 or 15 leagues away. And they were um, originally right over here in um, the St. Pete area and they kept talking about how Panuco was only 10 or 15 leagues north of where they were, so somewhere around here, but Panuco is actually over here. So that just gives you an idea of kind of where they were trying to go. Um, we're gonna focus on the Florida part because that's kind of our point today. Um, and, and the thing that's really fascinating about Cabeza de Vaca's text is that it's from him that we have all of the surviving records of the cultures of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, we just don't have any other chronicles. But remember, none of this was based on field journals or anything. I mean, he was enslaved by several different groups. He traveled as a shaman for a while. He didn't like write stuff down on the fly. So he came back to Spanish territory and then he wrote things down. And, um, but it's from him, for example, that Europe has its first um, knowledge of the American bison. So we're talking about bulls and bullfighting. Um, he called them hunchbacked cows. So that was interesting. Um, so he makes it, they, they land St. Pete here, and um, they hear from some Indians, they catch some people, uh, and they, they find guides, they hear about this place in the north called Apalache. And they go to Apalache because they've been told that's where all the gold is, right? Because, of course. And they get to Apalache, and uh, there's no gold there. And they say, no, there's no gold here, but there's a place called Aute, it's a few days' journey away. Um, and uh, they've got lots of gold there, right? So, um, so they keep moving on, and as they go, um, they have increasingly um, difficult relationships with the indigenous populations. But one of the things I wanna point out today is the way that communication happened, because like nobody had been there before, so it's not like they had translators, right? So they just kinda showed up and were talking to people, and they said, you know, they just showed up, this is the first day. The next day, the Indians in that village came, and although they spoke to us as we had no interpreters, we did not understand them, but they made many gestures and threats and seemed as if they beckoned us to leave the country. And it kind of begs the question, like, how did you know that? You know, how do you know what they're saying? And when they're asking, where's all the gold? Where's the maize? They were hungry. Of course, there's nothing to eat in Florida. Where's the maize? Where's the, where's the beans? You know, but they don't really know what they're saying. And so there's all these breakdowns of, of, of language and communication, particularly in the Florida part, before Cabeza de Vaca spent the next eight years living with different groups and, of course, learning several languages as he went. Um, and here again, we inquired of the Indians by signs whence they had obtained these things, and they gave us to understand that. Hey, Apalache, go over there, right? <laughs> And then on their way to Apalache, they meet this other group that says that they're gonna help him. From his gestures, it seemed to us that he was an enemy of the Apalaches, and then he would go and help us. But again, from his gestures alone, this is how we're sort of understanding what's happening with, with Cabeza de Vaca. And so part of the failed nature of these expeditions has to do with they don't really know how to communicate with people. And I think that that's part of, um, it took them from May 1st, when they landed, to June 25th to reach that Apalache place. Um, and one of the things that's interesting about this text is not just the nature of the communication between Cabeza de Vaca and the indigenous people, I mean Cabeza de Vaca's group, is the textual hybridity of this chronicle. Um, because it was written so far after, it's sort of half chronicle and half narrative. And so you're reading this as a literary text and it's very exciting, right? Because they have these indigenous people that are coming out of the swamp and right, they're trying to go get water and then people come out of the lake and like start shooting them with arrows and it's, it's just really exciting. But it's also really tragic too, because you figure this guy's walking around for eight years trying to get home, you know? And this is just a very compelling narrative. I know, it's funny now, but when you were there, I suppose it <laughs> probably lost something. So these are the sort of um, beginnings of our literary um, encounters of, of Florida in terms of chronicles and narratives specifically and fiction. So I wanna take a little hop, skip and a jump through time here and go to the 19th century. This is, uh, this is the time of Francisco de Goya. Um, and this is Felix Varela. Felix Varela uh, lived from 1788 to 1853 and he was born in St. Augustine. And he grew up there and he returned to Cuba to attend seminary and become a teacher. And while he was teaching, he had many, many students, among them Rafael Maria de Mendive, who also became a teacher and became the teacher of Jose Marti, who is the famous Cuban poet. I'm sure some of you have heard the song Guantanamera. Guantanamera, I'm gonna dance her. <laughs> Which uses his most famous poem. Um, in 1821, Felix Varela was sent to Spain uh, kind of as an ambassador from Cuba, and he was supposed to 
advocate for Cuban independence. And this is 1821, so this is right after what had happened with the French. Spain wasn't like all excited about hearing Cuba say they wanted to be independent. Um, and he was also advocating for, for abolition of slaves in Cuba. So this is a long time before um, American abolition movements were sort of really rooted. Um, interestingly, the French came back shortly after that and they sentenced Vardala to death. He fled to the US and lived the rest of his life in New York City, uh, except the last five years of his life when he lived in St. Augustine. Um, and he founded actually the first Spanish language newspaper in the United States called El Habanero in New York City. Um, Jose Martí was, was heavily influenced by um, the shared values, the, sh the values that he shared with Varela. Among them were things like a scientific education, a moral education in patriotism, Latin Americanism, honor, dignity, equal rights, aesthetic education, and physical education. And these actually became the hallmarks of early Cuban nationalistic education projects that were later co-opted by the revolution in the 20th century. And also, um, according to some critics, these two men, Felix Varela and Jose Martí, are sort of bookends uh, in the creation of a, a pedagogy of Cuban ethics, right, that sort of um, carries Cuba into the 20th century and, and now beyond, right? And so this, this sort of educational project is one of the best things that Cuba came up with, and this is in the early 1800s, and that sort of projected Cuban education um, through. And then, let's go up to Picasso's time. Ernest Hemingway, so you may have heard of him. He's sort of an unfamiliar Spanish author. He was born in 18, no really, 1899, and he lived until 1961. He only wrote seven novels. One of them was uh, set in the United States. Guess where? The Florida Keys. <laughs> so here's our Florida connection. What's really fascinating about Ernest Hemingway is um, he lived in Spain. So he's an American who's writing about expatriate communities for the most part, and particularly Spanish communities. Um, uh, he lived in his farm in, uh, in, I'm sorry, his famous Key West house from 1931 to 1939. And during this time, he published that novel that's set in Key West in Cuba called To Have and To Have Not. Um, and then he sort of traveled back and forth from Key West. He became a correspondent for the Spanish Civil War in 1937, and he was there and back and forth from Spain to Key West several times between 1937 and 1939. The war had just started um, one year previous to that. Um, he published the famous novel For Whom the Bell Tolls in 1940, which is based on his experiences um, in the Spanish Civil War. And then he also wrote uh, and researched the novel Death in the Afternoon, well not a novel, it's a nonfiction book, Death in the Afternoon, which is all about bullfighting and it's interesting because, and I'll talk about this in a minute, the Tauromachia series by Goya does exactly the same thing as Hemingway's novel Death in the Afternoon, but from a completely opposite perspective because Hemingway's explaining it to a foreign audience and Goya is looking at it as a Spaniard trying to understand and reclaim some of his own um, Spanish culture. Um, so he was basically researching and writing about Spain significantly the whole time he was living in Key West. Which, I mean, and he was also a huge fan of um, Spanish author Pio Baroja, who, um, when, he, when Hemingway won his Nobel Prize, he went to, he went to Baroja's on his deathbed and told him that he thought that Baroja deserved the prize more than he did. And Baroja was like, yes, you're right. <laughs> and then Hemingway, <laughs> Hemingway was not real happy. So here are the three novels that I talked about. Here is To Have and To Have Not. Uh, for Whom the Bell Tolls from 1940, and Death in the Afternoon, which was researched in 1929 and published in 1932. Um, I want to just briefly talk about uh, For Whom the Bell Tolls, because uh, how many of you read that? OK, how many of you really read that? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> It's one of those books that everyone wants to have said they read. It's, it's kind of a slog, right? When you're reading through it and you're thinking, geez, this is really boring. Like it's, and it's weird. The language is just weird, right? Nobody talks like that. And I've always thought that about Hemingway in general. We've kind of had a difficult relationship over the years. And uh, the thing that happened when I was reading this dialogue and I realized it was like, this is just, it's, it's weird. It's like reading Spanish. And then I realized that Hemingway, in fact, was writing in Spanish, but he was writing it in English. And so a lot of his dialogue in... Um, in For Whom the Bell Tolls kind of was reminiscent of uh, Cabeza de Vaca's attempts to communicate with people in the new world by whatever means necessary. But he's actually trying to do it with you and communicate with you via a medium of language you can't use, right? So how do you do that artistically? Um, 
So um, in this novel, uh, his, Robert Jordan is an American Spanish professor, so I kind of relate to that a little bit. Um, he says, he calls his girlfriend Little Rabbit, which sounds very weird to us, but in Spanish that would be a term of endearment. He, they use thee and thou, um, because in English we, we don't use the pronoun all, formal and inf informal use. Um, and, 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 and his use of obscenities, which anyone who, who knows Spain or has been to Spain, uh, they love obscenities in Spain, it's really a thing. And, um, <laughs> and Hemingway sometimes uses the Spanish word, the obscenity. Uh, sometimes he writes the word obscenity, and sometimes he, transla he translates um, idiomatic expressions. Like there's, a, there's an expression that involves defecating in your mother's milk, and he says, I obscenity in the milk. And it doesn't make any sense to you unless you know that expression in Spanish, but it's very common. Um, Gail Rogers, I read this interesting article by Gail Rogers, she calls it Cubist Spanglish. And in effect, that's exactly what it is, right? You're taking these languages and you're taking them apart and putting them together from different perspectives to help you get kind of a more multifaceted sense of the cultural comparisons and the cultural interactions that are happening here. And the other novel I want to, novel book, I want to talk about is Death in the Afternoon. Um, <laughs> one critic says that uh, even if you hate bullfighting when you start reading this book, you, you kind of end up loving it because Hemingway is relentless. I think that's true. Uh, what happens, interestingly, is um, we talked about Goya and recuperating the sense of bullfighting and how Picasso feels like that's the central to the spirit of Spain. But it's not always been like that with Spanish writers and thinkers. In the generation of 1898, they kind of hated bullfighting a lot. And all of the major thinkers, Unamuno and Maestu and Baroja, they keep talking about how bullfighting is so archaic and so barbaric and how it's just a rejection by Spain of everything that's in the modern world, right? And then we come to, you know, like I said, a few years later, we have Picasso kind of revivifying it. And then you have people from the outside, like Hemingway, trying to explain to people why Bullfighting is so great, and it's it's not even like it's not even like persuasive. It's more like an instruction manual. Like, okay, if you're a woman, and this might bother you a little bit, you need to sit here, 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 or here, and then leave after the first bull. And that is a direct quote from the novel. Um, um, here are some interesting passages. Here, the aficionado a level of the bullfight may be said broadly then to be the one who has this sense of the tragedy and ritual of the fight. So for Hemingway, bullfighting is not an art. Bullfighting is not a theater piece, and it's not a fight. I mean, even in English, we don't use the right word. It's a running. Each bullfight is called a corrida, right? And um, for, for Hemingway, it's not a fight. It's a tragedy, right? This is ending in certain death, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad. And he says, we like tragedy. We watch, I mean, now we watch what? We watch CSI. We watch television dramas all the time. We like tragedy. And he says, but the thing is, is either you have this or you have not. If you're going to be too sensible to tragedy to handle this, then this really isn't for you. And then sometimes he has these beautiful narrative descriptive passages that kind of take you away into the whole experience of bullfighting, even maybe against your will. And here he's talking about a gypsy, uh, a gypsy matador. And he says, sometimes standing absolutely straight with his feet still planted as though he were a tree with the arrogance and a grace that gypsies have and of which all other arrogance and grace seems an imitation moves the cape spread full as the pulling jib of a yacht before the bull's muzzle so slowly. And then he says at the end, this is the worst sort of flowery writing, but it's necessary to give you the feeling, right? This is, <laughs> I mean, at least he's, he's, he's claiming it, right? And what I wanted to point out to you is then that um, with Hemingway, and maybe with all of you who are coming to this from perhaps a foreign perspective, right, that there are different ways of looking at these things. There are different perspectives that we bring to this art of Spanish life, right? We see bullfighting, we see these um, etchings by Goya, we see this literature and these literary encounters. And Florida has been a stage for all of that for many, many years. And so with that said, I'd like to uh, pass it on to my colleague Andrew over here and he's gonna tell us a little bit more about those interesting connections. Thank you, Melissa. Okay, I think we all learned a really good way to be Spanish is just to curse a lot, and we come to Florida to be even more Spanish every single day of our lives. We just got permission, I think, from Melissa to do so. Um, and admittedly, I was an English major, undergrad. I've never read Hemingway, so now I feel bad about that, too. Okay, but let's move on. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Andrew Combs. Andrew is a professor of art 
at Polk State College in Winter Haven, Florida, where he teaches ceramics and three-dimensional design courses. He began his ceramic career making pinch pots in his father's pottery studio and continues to make functional works today. He earned his MFA in ceramics in 2008 from the School for American Crafts at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Andrew. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, thank you for having me here this evening. I'm really, really excited to get to share some of this uh, with you. Uh, so in the sort of 10 minutes that I have here, I want to tell you where I'm going to go. Um, I make ceramics. I'm not an archaeologist, uh, but I've looked into it, right? So um, I'll share some of that with you. Uh, we're going to go back, uh, way back, to start with, um, maybe first century BC. Then we're going to skip back forward uh, up into the 16th century, Spain, uh, Spanish explorers in Florida. Then we're going to get back into the 20th century and see uh, how how these pots are sort of markers of, of culture that, that last with us and, and how you can also see them in Picasso ceramics. So it'll all come back together in the end, I promise. Um, so this pot that's up here is, is a really fantastic example of a Spanish olive jar, right? These jars were what people used uh, to transport all their supplies, right? And I want to go back in time now. These are Roman amphora, right? So first century uh, BC up through, uh, I think, the sixth century uh, the current era. Uh, these are Roman. They were actually found in Spain, in Tarragona. Um, and these were the pots that, that would be in ships uh, that, that people would use as, as trading to, to move goods around and also as their supplies, right? These are essentially the Tupperware of the time, right? This is, this is what you kept your food in, all your supplies. Um, one of the things that I want you to notice about them that's unusual to us today is the bottoms of them, right? You notice they all have some way to make them stand up. Uh, and to, why would you do that, right? Well, of course, a ship, you know, the ship's hull, it's not square. It's not a flat bottom. It's a keel, right? So it's curved. So if you made flat things, they wouldn't sit flat in that ship. So they're able to stack them up and stack them on top of each other. So it makes perfect sense. When you unload them from the ship, then they would, you know, you don't have as many tables. You probably didn't bring a lot of tables with you on the ship, right? Uh, so you don't have flat surfaces. You can put them right in the dirt and they'll stand up and, and be very sturdy. Um, from here, I want to jump ahead now, and yep, yeah, there we go. So this is uh, from uh, John Goggins, who is an archaeologist, and in 1960, he did a lot, a lot of research into these uh, Spanish olive jars, and he found that you can really date them by the type. Um, he, he creates types, and, and you can take them through different, different periods. So we're really looking at these early style. Um, olive jars, right? These very round jars, uh, almost like spherical. They typically would have these two handles um, and that narrow neck. Um, and these are, are the type of jars that would have been brought uh, in those first sort of failed uh, settlement attempts. And I want to talk a little bit about the uh, Tristan de Luna, his expedition um, <clears throat> to Florida. Because I think it's, one, it's a really interesting time. It's the first multi-year settlement um, in what's now the US. Uh, and he brought with him, of course, a lot of supplies, right? And they would have been in this type of, of olive jar, this early type, these really round ones. I have to look at my dates here. But um, he arrived, actually, in Pensacola Bay, it looks like August 14th, 1559. So these would have been the type of pots that he had with him. Um, what's really interesting is that this settlement has only recently been discovered, right? There's been a lot of archaeological research. University of West Florida has been um, really involved. They found a couple uh, shipwrecks first to start with, and then uh, this is really all in like the last 10 years. In 2015, they actually found the site 
of the settlement, of the Luna settlement. And since then, they have found a third shipwreck. So with this, there's all these pieces of, of pottery, right? Because the amazing thing about pottery, um, not being organic, being this rock, is that it lasts for thousands and thousands of years. Yes, you can break it, sure, it's fragile, but those pieces will still be here. And if you don't break it, we get a nice whole one like that. Um, so uh, Tristan de Luna, he starts in Veracruz and makes his way to Pensacola Bay. Right? The goal of this settlement was to find an overland route to Santa Elena, uh, which is in South Carolina. They didn't ever get there. Right? I said he arrived August 14th. And September 19th to 20th, one month after they have arrived and started this settlement, a hurricane hits the bay, a big hurricane. He had brought with him 11 ships um, and 1,100 people. I mean, he was well, well stocked, well supplied. Um, you know, these, these expeditions, typically they would have about three times the amount of supplies as the English uh, settlements and colonies, right? When you think of Jamestown, I grew up in Virginia, so we would have believed Jamestown was the first, which now I know is not true, right? Um, <clears throat> but uh, so they were, they were well prepared, but this hurricane hits and it destroys, of his 11 ships, sinks eight of them. Now they had stored their supplies on the ships because it was safer, right? There aren't animals, no one can take it. So they lost almost all of their supplies, right? So, I mean, I would have left at this point. I gotta be honest here. I'm impressed that they really stuck it up. They ended up being there till 1561 and making it the first um, multi-year settlement. Um, and here are some of the pieces. Those larger pieces of, of pots are from a couple of the, I believe the Emanuel Point One, which is the, the first shipwreck that they found. And the smaller ones are from the, the settlement. So you can see that these things you know, have lasted, even if they're in pieces. And I think they, these pots really serve as um, a marker, a physical marker of culture and how it's spread. You have this object that people carried their supplies in. These olive jars typically, um, they didn't actually have olives in them. Uh, they would have olive oil, uh, honey, wine, supplies like that, um, uh, general food kind of stuff. Um, this one is a particularly nice piece. Uh, it was from, uh, again, the Emanuel Point One wreck. Uh, this larger piece here, and it is one of these early type olive jars, right? You can see this round form, right? And that nice rolled thick rim, and it actually still has the cork in it, preserved in it, which is amazing. I think everything leaked out of it though, so unfortunately. <laughs> um, great, and so here is, uh, this is actually Tom Garner, who was a research assistant, holding one of the neck shirts um, of an early Spanish olive jar, and these necks, um, you know, archaeologists seem to love them. And I think the reason is because they survive, right, as whole. Those, those necks are thicker, right? When you think about how a pot gets used, that's where you interact with it. You pour things in and out, you might stack things on top of it. That's what's most fragile. That's what's prone to being broken, right? So they're made thicker, and that tends to survive as whole, and that gives you a really good idea of what the whole piece looks like, right? And it makes for a great photo opportunity, so. <laughs> And now I want to skip ahead to modern day. As I was doing this research, I was, I was reading a doctoral thesis. Uh, Dr. George Avery um, was examining these, these um, Spanish uh, jars and, and sort of uh, that they're storage containers. And you know, he, of course, the primary use that he investigates, the historical use, is as a supply container. But he was investigating uh, contemporary secondary uses that he came across in the Gainesville Sun in 1994 in an ad for uh, women's turtlenecks, right? Uh, which seems really, really funny. And I think in the context of his, of his thesis, it is kind of a, a joke, but for us, it's really interesting how these pots have filtered into contemporary life that we don't really think of it. It's just a pretty object to be in the background, but really it's a marker of, of this culture. It's a lasting piece of how you know, this, was, this, was, this European and Spanish influence in Florida. It's right there, right in the background. We don't even notice it. So now you can start to see it. Another really interesting thing is, again, you see it's got this stand, right? 
Um, now, of course, it didn't come with the stand originally. That's a very contemporary interpretation. You know, we don't know what to do with these round bottom pots. You have to hold them. You need somewhere to set them. Um, you know, obviously, on those uh, 11 ships, they probably didn't have a lot of room for tables. Um, if they did, maybe that with the table ship got sunk, right? Uh, so it's really interesting how we interpret these and how we use them today and how we sort of make these modifications to them. Um, from here, I really want to talk about now looking at some of those pots from the show in the gallery, right? And if you look at that pot on the left, that picture with the woman on it, it's, it's a beautiful form. And now imagine if instead of a flat bottom, it came to a point and there was a second handle on it, right? That takes us right back to that form of those amphorae, those Roman pots, right? That same same idea, right? Right through into the 20th century. And as we look at the storage jar, um, the owl on the right, right? Again, if you took these, these same things, flattened the bottom, maybe stretched them out a little bit and widened the rim so you could get your hand in there, right? We're not really trying to keep um, things in as much now. You've really, you can see how they relate to those, those same kind of forms throughout history, you know, the last couple thousand years and before that. Um, and in my research, I also found this pot of Picasso's, which just beautifully tied everything together. I mean, you look at the form, you see this round, round thing with the narrow neck. It really, to me, is talking about those early Spanish olive jars, um, those, those forms. Imagine if instead of just one handle, you know, it had two, you're really pretty close to it there. And then, of course, the scene of, of this bullfight, right? We've got this bull on here. And I think this is a beautiful, beautiful example of, of what Picasso is doing on ceramics. You know, he's working in 2D, he's incising, he's painting, but he's putting it on this 3D form. And all of a sudden, this, this decoration comes to life. It has movement, it has volume, you know, the head is lowered, you can see it charging, right? We've got the sand of the arena, the uh, uh, banderillo uh, up there in the back of, of, the, uh, of the bowl. I mean, this thing is it's really coming to life and moving through space, you know? And of course, the bull, um, Dr. Rich talked to us about that idea of machismo, right? And, and, uh, and Picasso. And, you know, I think you can really see that <laughs> in, in the piece that, that that is. I had to search a little harder for that image. It wasn't. Uh, the, the Christie's auction website didn't feature that one. But still, I mean, look at what he's done with the tail and the handle, you know, that, that moves out into space, that this thing is running through it. Um, so I really think that this, this pot and, and all of those really sort of trace a lineage of culture, um, you know, from Spain, of course, to Florida, but even before that, throughout the Mediterranean, throughout human history, we can really look at pots and form and, and see how that makes a record for us. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. I never thought that my name and an image of bull's testicles would be so closely aligned. OK, that's a first. OK, good. Um, well, that brings us to our final panelist tonight. I am honored to introduce Mr. John A. Ragnon. Um, John is president of El Centro Español de Tampa, the oldest Spanish social service club in Tampa. He is a lifelong resident of Tampa who received his BS in engineering at the University of South Florida. He is fluent in Spanish, and his consulting experience included assignments in Central and South America and in Puerto Rico. Among his many civic duties, he served as president of the Ybor City Rotary Club and Ybor City Development Corporation. It's my pleasure to introduce John A. Ragnon. Buenas tardes, españoles, y descendientes de españoles, y personas que les gustaría ser español, damas y caballeros. So how many of you are worried that this is going to be all in Spanish? <laughs> don't, don't be concerned. I feel so inadequate. I'm following three PhDs and a Master of Art, and here, here all you're going to get from me is BS. Right? So, <laughs> Thank you. 
So as it happens, I'm the caboose on a very short Spanish train. And as many of you know, Spanish trains run on time. That was not always so. And as I was preparing my mark remarks for this evening, I was um, aware of the time allotted to me, but I decided that I would revert to old Spain and not be so concerned about the time, but be more concerned about leaving a good last impression like the caboose that I am. <laughs> I should have shown you this first, but I'm not going to tell you about it until the end. So um, as the previous panelists have reminded us, more often than not, when people think of the Spanish influence in Florida, the experiences of the explorers come to mind. Thus, St. Augustine and to a lesser degree, Pensacola are preeminent in our consciousness. But we know shortly after their arrival, the explorers turned their attention uh, elsewhere and found the riches that they were searching for in Mexico and Peru and other places. It took n nearly four centuries for Spaniards to return and stay. In Florida, they did so in an unlikely place, Tampa. The story of our arrival and permanence is a fascinating one and resonates still to this day. The story begins in Cuba. In the late 19th century, our neighbor to the south was in turmoil as the majority of the population sought independence from the yoke that was Spanish colonial rule and governance. One of the many industries that suffered during those turbulent times was the cigar industry. And stressing the owners even further is that the US imposed a strict tariff on imported cigars. Sound familiar? <laughs> but interestingly, not on tobacco leaf. To escape the cauldron of strife and to take advantage of the absence of a tariff on tobacco leaf, several industry owners decided to move their operations to Key West. Notably among them, was a Spanish expatriate from Valencia by the name of Vicente Martinez Ibor. In October of 1868, Don Vicente took the leap of faith and established the factory that produced his well-known brand, the Prince of Wales, in Key West. The move lasted a relatively long time, but it did not end well. Beset by its isolation, by the lack of fresh water, by poor transportation, and because uh, Don Vicente experienced the same labor difficulties that he experienced in Cuba, uh, he set about looking for a place to move his factory. His search began in earnest in 1885 and was concluded in April of the following year when his beloved Prince of Wales factory was destroyed in a fire. That he and his friendly competitor, Ignacio Aya of New York, chose Tampa instead of Pensacola and Mobile and Galveston is the backdrop to the Spanish immigrant story. Don Vicente selected Tampa because the railroad had arrived recently in 1884 thus putting an end to Tampa's own isolation from the populous Northeast and Midwest and their cigar-loving consumers. He also selected Tampa because its climate was favorable in comparison to the growing and manufacturing regions in Cuba. And he also chose Tampa because he knew that he could continue to recruit skilled workers for his new factory. A shrewd businessman, Don Vicente instinctively knew that achieving a critical mass in manufacturing in his adopted city was a benefit, not a threat to his business. So he urged his competitors to join him, and they did. The first cigar was rolled in 1886. 
By the early 1900s, the industry had gained traction. Don Vicente did not live to see its heyday, but, by the, but the city that he adopted was to become known as the cigar capital of the world. That is not an exaggeration. By the 1920s, cigar makers in Tampa were producing an astonishing 450 million hand-rolled cigars per year. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The Spaniards, Cubans, Italians, and others that began arriving in 1886 discovered a forlorn village of fewer than 1,000 inhabitants where streets of sand predominated and where alligators, mosquitoes, tropical disease, and the absence of basic social and medical institutions proved daunting, not to mention the clash of cultures and language. But Martinez Ibor and Aya persisted, and soon an industry was born uh, in a very short period of time. The primitive conditions that the first wave of skilled Spaniards and Cubans found were improved by the provision of housing, sanitation, food, and transportation. Absent from the improvements in the early years was the, were the institutions that provided social services. But then, in December 1891, barely five years after the first cigar was rolled, several dozen Spanish immigrants formed the Centro Español de Tampa. Its creation provided a means for the growing Spanish immigrant community to maintain its cultural identity and to provide a sense of belonging in a place where the local population looked warily at the newcomers. Later, the Centro would transform itself into a true mutual aid society, providing cradle-to-grave services, including health services. The Centro Español was followed by the creation of a second Spanish association, the Centro Asturiano, also still in existence, as well as associations serving the Cuban, Italian, and German immigrant populations. The growth and prosperity of the Centro Español and the other similar associations was linked to the success of the cigar industry. As the industry prospered in the early 20th century, so too did the vibrancy and prosperity of the social institutions. By 1920, the Centro Español had constructed two grand clubhouses, one in Ybor City on the left and the second in West Tampa, a hospital, a medical clinic, and a cemetery. Both of the clubhouses were grand in appearance, scale, and filled with amenities, each housing a cantina, a theater, a ballroom, and a library. The hospital, dating to 1904, was state of the art for its time, and perhaps for a good while after the preeminent hospital in the state of Florida. However, the Spanish influence in Tampa extends beyond its architectural legacy. It also includes the richness of contributions made by individuals that comprised the colony, contributions that transcended the centro. These include notable men and included and include notable men and women in industry, the law, education, architecture, the arts, medicine, politics, business, and sports. In the early years, our first presidents distinguished themselves not only in their service to the Centro, but also to a growing and ever more prosperous cigar industry in Tampa. Pictured here on the left is our first president, Don Ignacio Aya, the same Ignacio Aya who was a co-founder of the cigar industry in Tampa, as well as important successor presidents, Vicente Guerra, and Angel Cuesta. As for those who follow, followed, I can cite a few examples of the effect of assimilation and the richness of the contributions of individuals comprising the Spanish colony. I mentioned 
the governor of the state of Florida, the chief of police of the city of Tampa, a president of the Florida Senate, a president of the National Education Association, chiefs of surgery, authors of national prominence, painters, and of course, baseball luminaries. I would be remiss not to mention two additional notables by name. The first is my uncle John, or Juan, who is present this evening. A native of Spain, my uncle continues to practice architecture in Tampa some 66 years after he graduated from the University of Florida. Secondly, I acknowledge one of Florida Southern's most distinguished graduates and current trustee, the retired Florida appellate court judge, the Honorable E.J. Southinas. Judge Southinas returned to Tampa this evening from a trip to Europe and could not be with us. His presence would certainly have added spice to this event. <laughs> Time passes, things change, what once was vibrant and grand is now diminished. Inquiring minds may ask, ¿Qué pasó? What happened? Well, the external factors that led to the near demise of the Tampa Bay cigar industry also had a profound effect on the social clubs. These factors included the drop in demand for premium cigars brought about the brought about by the World War I and later the Depression, the consolidation of the cigar companies, which led to the demise of single owner factories replaced by large North American corporations, mechanization, the, popular, the popularity of cigarettes, prohibition, which lasted a very long 13 years, thank you, the flight to the suburbs after World War I and the Cuban cigar embargo. Additionally, we must recognize one other important external factor and one important internal factor. First, the advent of Social Security embedded in the reforms of the New Deal and the emergence of private medical insurance that was increasingly provided by companies after World War II meant that our members no longer had to rely on the Centro for their medical care. And second, by the end of World War II, the descendants of the first immigrants were more numerous and more proper, prosperous. And they didn't work in a single industry, and they didn't reside in a single neighborhood, and they had many opportunities to become educated, to socialize, to recreate, and to receive health care. In other words, we became one with the culture of the United States. You may wonder how the story of Spanish immigrant community in Tampa fits in with the rest of Spanish immigration in the United States. As I entered adulthood, I came to believe that the Tampa experience might be unique in the US. Was it so? Well, within the past decade, that view of uniqueness has been validated through the work of Dr. James Fernandez of New York University, who has been studying Spanish immigrant immigration in the US exhaustively. He writes, and I quote, the Spanish community in Tampa was probably the largest of all, and it was most certainly the most compact and enduring of all of the Spanish colonias in the US. Whereas Spanish immigrants in most places had to adapt to pre-existing social and labor conditions, the Spaniards in Tampa actually played a role in the creation of the modern manufacturing center that Tampa became. And while the Spaniards in most places left very few visible markers of their presence after their dispersion and assimilation, Tampeños have bequeathed us a remarkable but precarious legacy of brick and mortar, granite, and porcelain. This basic fact, immigrants in Tampa were in important ways founders of their own community, is the basis of Tampa's uniqueness among Spanish enclaves. So what about my family? Well, 
Our story begins in 1921, more than 30 years after the cigar industry was founded. In that year, my paternal grandfather, Domingo, second from the left, arrived from Spain via Cuba, like so many others, second from the right. <laughs> that, that would not, I, I heard my sister objecting to what I just said. And so, so I knew I had made a mistake. Uh, seeking a better life. At the time, he left behind his wife, my grandmother Ramona, third from the right, and my father Angel, third from the left, in Spain. A skilled carpenter, my grandfather plied his trade away from his family for 10 long, lonely years. The only time he was reunited with his family was in 1927 when he traveled back to Spain to say farewell to his dying father. By the way, during that visit, he also did his part to ensure that his second son, Juan, who you just met, was eventually brought into this world. <laughs> After returning to Tampa, this time through Ellis Island, my grandfather is, continued to establish himself economically and wait patiently for permission to bring his young family to Tampa, knowing that the U.S. Immigration Act of 1924 severely restricted immigration based on national origin. Then finally, in December 1930, the U.S. Consul in Vigo sent my grandmother a letter indicating that the U.S. was issuing three entry documents for her and her two sons. They hastily gathered the belongings that they were allowed to transport and sail to Tampa. So finally, in January 1931, my paternal nuclear family was together at last in Tampa. Parenthetically, an early 20th century example of chain migration. <laughs> so what about the future? Well, when an immigrant colony such as ours becomes assimilated into a native culture, each new generation is increasingly distant from the first. And for each, the bond that existed between the old world and the new world is weakened. Such is the case for the Spanish colony in Tampa and for the Centro Español. But despite the challenges of time and memory and language, those of us who care about the legacy of our institution and our heritage will carry on as best we can. We shall perform good deeds until all of the money runs out or until we are all gone. This may sound like a typically Spanish fatalistic viewpoint, but at least it's honest. As long as we can, we will do this. We will honor, preserve, and celebrate the legacy of the Spanish community in Tampa, and we will have as good a time as possible doing so. Our forefathers would expect nothing less. So earlier, you heard that the premise of tonight's event was uh, the posing of this question. If Goya and Picasso identified the bullfight as the most potent uh, symbol of Spanish tradition, what can we identify as essentially Spanish in Florida? Well, if Goya and Picasso were able to come back, and if the Tampeños in the audience were allowed to host them in their travels around Florida, and the first place we took them was to see this sculpture, Goya and Picasso might reasonably ask us, what is Don Quixote doing in a lobby of a bank in downtown Tampa? <laughs> to which we might reasonably reply, Don Francisco, Don Pablo, do we have a story to tell you? <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, while we have our panelists move up to the stage for the second segment of our program tonight, watch this.
This is exciting. Um, we have about 30 minutes allocated now for discussion and Q&A, so I ask you to take advantage of the fact that we have all these great experts, um, perhaps including myself, but I'm one of the panelists as well, so if you have questions about anything that we have discussed this evening, anything you are wondering about in terms of the theme of the program, please, um, we have a microphone set up in the middle here, and we will address them to each of the individual panelists. They are set up in the order of their presentations, including me. So anybody who wants to ask a question, please make your way to the microphone in the middle. <coughs> More like 15 minutes, okay. Okay, so 15 minutes or so. Any questions? Yes, go ahead. And just to let you know, I will be repeating the questions so that those in the overflow room are able to hear it as well. So just pause for one sec. Thank you. I grew up and started school in Tampa, and my mother was in charge of the color sorters at Standard Cigar Factory. So my, qu my question is, I, I'm familiar with some of this, and I believe the hospital has closed, um, but I know that some of the social clubs still there. I've, I've met people that are a part of that. Do you see some young people stepping up? And I don't mean to insult your age, but obviously we are aging. Well, I understand, and it's a fair question, and it's a great challenge. And part of the answer is standing in the back of the room. My son, Michael, is here, and I talked him into joining our club. And we're trying very hard to uh, recruit uh, younger members because this is not going to continue unless they take up the, the, the challenge, if you will. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes, okay. Make your way to the middle, please. Thank you. Hi. Um, my question is about the cover of the, the picture here. Yes. Is the bullfighter chained to the chair? Is the bull like, in the in the Goya plate? Is the yeah. bullfighter chained to looks the chair? Like he is shackled. Shackled. Um, yes, he he is. And well, do you know why? Although no, I'm not. I'm actually I'm not sure if he's shackled to the chair or his just his his just a, ankles his are feet, shackled. His, his feet are shackled. Yeah, his yeah. feet are shackled to one to each other, not the chair. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Do you know why? I do not. But is Roy mm -hmm. Kerr here? Roy. Roy, Roy had to leave. Well, this would be a good tease. I'll tease something. You'll get a better answer next Thursday or Friday. Okay, I'll tease that a little bit. He'll give you a better answer than I. Okay, go ahead. Next, next question. I, I, I might be able to address that actually. Okay, go ahead. Um, because Hemingway talks about this, and and I and I, this is speculation based on Death in the Afternoon and what he says there. But um, during the training, there's some training runs for bulls, and one of the things that bullfighters are supposed to do is keep their feet very very firmly planted because if their feet jump nervously away, the bull stops going for the cape and goes for the man, and it's one of the things that you don't want to train the bull not to do because it's the the bull is in the ring for the first time and that's good we want that um, but to keep the bullfighters from doing that 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 could be a reason why they would shackle his feet together hypothetically okay thank you Melissa go ahead right so we talked about how the theme of this evening is kind of the bull as a symbol of Spanish pride and Spanish heritage and I and it was kind of enjoyable and this kind of was a question I've been musing uh, Dr. Gar you did mention something to the effect of in the 18th century that bullfighting amongst the intellectual class did go down in popularity. 1898, yeah. Thank you. Now in, now in modern Spain, especially amongst the youth, there is again this whole movement. Now I want to kind of hear like maybe y'all's perspective on how, Span, how, Span, how, the, how the bull is a symbol of Spain, like where, it's, where is it going? Because if the if the youth is rejecting bullfighting, and is it going to be cyclical, or are we or is Spain going to find a new symbol? What uh, what are your opinions on that? Okay, so the question is, what is the modern day, or at least twentieth, twenty first century rendition of the symbol of the bull to Spain in more recent history? And we'll move through the panel in that way. Um, let's start with, yeah, let's start with David. Oh me. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> no, I don't know. I think uh, you may have heard like this last decade, there's a lot of uh, controversy in Spain about bullfighting and uh, they prohibit it in Catalonia, for example. They see it as a, which is actually uh, very interesting as it connects to Spanish identity because I think when Catalonia is trying to get away from Spain, one of the first things they did was to forbid bullfighting. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, they claim it's because of the animal rights and everything else, which I'm sure it also is, but, but, it, but it's also because they see that as a symbol of, as a very, very strong symbol of a Spanish nationality uh, and identity, and so they, they did away with it. And um, But I don't know what the modern symbol of the bull would be. Uh, I guess the bull, because they continue to... Uh, I mean, just to chime in, I remember I was in Barcelona last February, and I was staying in a hotel right by the old bullfighting arena, and I was thrilled personally to see that it had been converted into a mall. So <laughs> there's, there's the modern symbol of bullfighting literally in Barcelona. I, clearly, I'm not for bullfighting. But Melissa, go ahead. It's an interesting question because um, part of that goes back to how the bull was co-opted by the Franco dictatorship in terms of um, creating a very centralized notion for tourism. You have the flamenco and you have these um, the paintings with España and you have the big sun, you know, and there's, these are very recognizable symbols. And there was also a series of billboards that are just oh, yeah. black bulls. They're silhouetted and they're everywhere in Spain. Like they're all through the country and those were all part of Franco's sort of nationalistic program. Yeah. So some of that... Um, actually is a rejection of Francoism, right? Um, and nowadays, I think there's a lot more discussion about it, because I think there's some, there's some desire to sort of find a Spanish identity in the global world, and, and that you might agree with me or not. Um, in, the, in the European Union, I think a lot of countries are sort of trying to figure out like, how you balance your personal like, cultural identity as a nation versus being a part of the European Union and the globalized world, which is not unlike projects that we're trying to do in the United States. So I think that um, how they're using the bull now is much more diversified. I'm sure that internet and technology has a lot to do with that as well. Yeah. No, actually, now that you mentioned the, the bulls on the roads, that's actually originally, it's a, it's a commercial for alcohol. It's for mm -hmm. the brand Osborne, which I'm sure you've seen. But when they, when they passed the law, that um, that you know you cannot advertise alcohol on on the roads on billboards. Um, um, you know people protested so much about the bulls that they actually made an exception. So so you cannot have any. Now nobody identifies that bull anymore with the brand of alcohol, with a, a brandy, with a Osborne. It's just such a strong symbol of the country that they made an exception for those billboards, and and you can still see them all over the all over the country. So, Andrew, any opinion? Uh, well outside of my area of expertise, but I could suggest that a new symbol might be the olive jar. If yeah. <laughs> well said. John. Let's, let's pitch the idea, yeah. <laughs> my opinion is that uh, bullfighting's on the way out, and I'm with Andrew on, on its replacement. Oh, I mean, nice. as, the, as the art historian here, I would venture to say, and I don't mean to aggrandize Picasso, but he's pretty much the grand master of the 20th century. I might dare say that just because of, you know, especially with visual imagery, with the popularization of the imagery of the bull via Picasso and or any other artist renditions, I think there's still always going to be that association of the bull, maybe outside the bullfight specifically, but I feel like the bull seems so essentially in my mind as a, re as a relation to Spain itself. Maybe we can divorce it from the cruelty of the bullfight. Um, okay, other... Question, so I have another hand. Okay, go ahead. Whoa, this is serious. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna go off of his last comment about the, uh, the bull, the new symbol. All right, so after hearing uh, them saying that the European country, I think, is denying like the sense of Spain and their, their pride, am I right? Or they just shut it down for... No, 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 no. I certainly okay. don't think that the European Union is shutting down their... I think that within the European Union, countries are trying to find like their own sense of how to balance their... As in for themselves, not, not with external pressure. Like the European Union is like, you can't be Spain anymore. You can't do this or you can't do that. But I think that there's some kind of um, blurring of frontiers, and that's just part of globalization, right? And it's certainly true in the European Union. It's a different kind of complex uh, interplay culturally. All right, so after the billboard comment, I was wondering, after you said, is there the symbol of the bull, do you think it's going to head towards more of a rebellion symbol? As in, they're going to keep trying to put it and force it out there because it's so, so close to their heart? Or do you think it's just going to eventually die out because of the bullfighting being kicked out? Honestly, I feel like it's going to be a satire. 
I, I, there's, there's, well, I mean, there's a lot of, um, currently in Spain, a lot of literature, a lot of pop culture stuff is very satirical. Um, and, and there's, uh, that, that's got a long tradition in Spain, literally speaking, we're talking about, you know, 1700s, well, what was dead manana and these kinds of things. And so this kind of self-deprecating humor is going to involve these large national symbols as sort of a, a way of expressing national pride, but also being sort of humble about it. It's a humble brag. Like a, um, like a funny rebellion. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's probably more immediately where it's going. Where it can go beyond that, who knows? I mean, mm -hmm. who knows where the world's gonna be in 10 years? 10 years ago, we didn't know where the world was gonna be now. Yeah, So. thank you. Uh, biographers of uh, Goya wrote down that he said, some days we are the bull, some days we are the matador. And it goes back to uh, Hemingway's concept of the bullfight not as a sport, not even as an event, but as a picture of life ending in tragedy. And if we think of the bull as the ultimate end, when Goya died, or the day he died, his biographer said that he told the doctor, leave me alone, me and the bull. And I think that's the problem with the bull is his virility and his, uh, and his <laughs> attitude of death, <laughs> uh, his virility and his concept of death kind of intertwine, and we see the strength of man and the weakness of man at the end. And that's the beauty of the bullfight. I don't like the bullfight, but that's the beauty of the bullfight. Do not ask for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for the bull. <laughs> and I guess the word I was looking for earlier with machismo was also cojones, right? Yeah. Because we have big cojones. Um, but I think also, and I think it's a really wonderful point, I think it's a good also summary of that suite that Goya presents. We start with the ancient Iberians bull hunting, and of course we end with, as I phrase it actually in the text of the show, because I felt like going the other way with the description of it, it's the bull seeking revenge. It is the violence of it, and the bull is finally winning out. We could read it that way, or we could see it as the great tragedy of that cycle of life. But the original 33 print suite ends with the killing of one of the celebrities of the day. So I want to toss something over for a second though to John because he brought a special surprise for us that literally brings our topic of our discussion today right here to Florida. So I'll turn it over to John for a second. Well, you mentioned earlier that Picasso loved himself first and women second, right? So one of the things he was a master of it was his sculpture. And in the uh, early 1970s, through a somewhat of a convoluted process, there was a possibility that one of his sculptures called The Bust of a Woman was to be constructed uh, on the main campus of the University of South Florida. If it happened, it would have been 100 feet tall and quite imposing on, <laughs> on the campus. Uh, and. Uh, there was an article recently in the Tampa Bay Times about a scholar and researcher in the Special Collections Department of USF that uncovered some material, including a model of the sculpture. Uh, and it resonated with me and my family because in the early 1970s, my father was intrigued by the po being a proud Spaniard as he was and knowing who Picasso was was intrigued about the possibility and, and being a skilled craftsman, he made his own model and here it is. <laughs> it's called The Bust of a Woman. Needless to say, uh, insufficient funds were raised uh, in the early 1970s to, to construct this behemoth. Uh, but it's uh, another tie uh, of Picasso in Florida. In, in an indirect way, but still there's a tough. So bottom line, we'll be taking donations tonight to construct this <laughs> at the Folk Museum of Art. Now, it, people have commented it was uh, an endeavor that was doomed to failure uh, because Picasso uh, was a radical politically and uh, had received the Lenin Prize, uh, of all things. And so the idea of having uh, 
piece of art created by him on the campus in the deep, deep south in the early 1970s just wasn't going to fly. And it didn't. Thank you very much, John. Um, so I think we're going to close up now. I want to tease a few upcoming events, first of all. So if you are intrigued, as I am, and I hope you remain, by the Master of Spain exhibition, please mark on your calendars that next Thursday evening at 5.30, Dr. Roy Kerr will be giving a lecture on Goya's art and life here in this auditorium. And on Friday, so that's, that's Thursday, April 12th, and on Friday, April 13th at noon, he will be giving a gallery talk in the show itself. With that, I want to thank everyone for coming this evening. I want to thank our eminent panel of scholars here. Let's give them a round of applause. I want to thank the Florida Humanities Council for the grant supporting this evening. I hope you all had a great time. I also want to extend special thanks to Suzanne Grossberg, who, without whom this would not have happened this evening. She was really responsible for this. Please, everyone, remember to fill out your surveys before you leave. And I'm sure any of the scholars here would be happy to speak with you individually if you have any questions as you're on your way out. Thank you all very much. Oh, and I just want to thank our ushers for the evening as well. Um, one, my coworker, Diane, and she's the curator of the Melvin Art Gallery, and one of my current students, Melanie. So please thank them also for helping this evening. Thank you, everyone, and hope to see you soon. <laughs>